Hello everyone, and it's that time again. Welcome to the Sydney St. James Show. We sure appreciate you dropping in. Hello everyone, Sydney St. James here with episode 20. What it's like to be a cemetery enthusiast or a tombstone tourist. A true family history story. As one who has studied genealogy for decades, I suppose you could also call me a cemetery enthusiast. I've learned the many ways people around the world honor their dead to put the pieces together from across the pond. Take the moss-covered mausoleums of Edinburgh to the candlelit cemeteries around the lands in Italy. In my studies of overseas family members, particularly those living in Rastetti in Oldenburg, Germany, and in Jerusalem, I learned of the small stones placed on Jewish graves in Jerusalem, and even the walls of urns that are located in Japan. There's so much that can be learned from wandering through cemeteries with shady paths that continue to invite us, addicted genealogists, to meander, read the epitaphs to those gone before us. Just the other day, I was somewhere visiting with friends, and after completing over a thousand hours of tromping through one cemetery after another, and then updating the family tree with Family Tree Maker or Ancestry.com, or even through a Basic A program that I wrote myself years ago. I was introduced to that someone who had just married into the family. When someone introduced me to him, he didn't want any help from me, the family historian, because he has taken the family way further back than I have. I suppose that bruised my ego a little after so many hours when it took him no more than a few hours of downloading off the internet. But little did that person walk through the cemeteries and high weeds or go to the Confederate States of America records and dig through the card files, or even walk the battlefield in the Battle of Vicksburg to retrieve information needed to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Really? Well, let's get on with why we're actually here today. My obsession with walking through old family cemeteries and transcribing one headstone after the other and then translating it from Hebrew to English or from German to English. What a chore that's been, but a fun undertaking to say the least. After all, I'm a cemetery enthusiast. I'd be sitting there listening to just how addicted I am. Well, Let's take my great-grandfather's first daughter, Alma. I knew she was not born in time to be in the 1870 census through the census records, but then in 1880, she was not associated with the family any longer in that sentence. But her name appeared in the family Bible, so I know she existed. Where was she? Many of my podcast followers have learned from my earlier mystery novels and romance suspense novels that I tend to make genealogy a part of the mystery. An example would be the one where a curse is left on the shores of where Thor was born, Nordney Island, or in the case of the Ace of Spades, as a young woman stands to inherit $10 million unless she is baited onto the tracks of the noonday train. But let's get back to my addiction. I seem to ramble sometimes on what I'm talking about, and you'll just have to forgive me for doing so, because I get excited when I'm talking about things that I love. Although it's not easy to track some family members. As a matter of fact, it's almost impossible many times that you might be seated and listening to my podcast today, and say, I have the record in the family Bible of her being born. Wasn't that enough? Actually, 
My answer to that is no. Why are the headstones so important in studying your family history? Tombstones often include data in addition to birth and death dates. For example, some memorials contain relationships with parents and spouses and with children. Sometimes the headstones have decorations that include symbols or words about occupations, possibly the cause of death or membership in religious organizations or even their general philosophies of life, providing essential details into the lives. These are so important because I never settle for a born and deaf date. That really doesn't tell me about the person. For many women and children who died before 1850 and children born and died between the census enumerations or before vital records were kept, a cemetery may provide the only description of that person's life. However, a person is laid to rest. There is one thing all these places have in common. They are vast libraries of unknown and untold stories. Sometimes the stories come to us easily, like following a gently worn path our ancestors left for us many years ago. Other times, the stories take hours and hours of time and research to uncover. Let's take, for example, going back to my great-grandfather's daughter's death in 1880. I knew where my grandfather had his home. It was on Shaw's Bend Road, just outside Columbus, Texas. I took Beulah, that was my 1954 Ford, with 21 speakers installed in it, and drove down the road and stopped at every farmhouse and asked the owner if there was a cemetery on their land. One December day, my days of driving and searching, the question was answered by Mr. Fitzgerald. When I asked him if there was an old cemetery on this land, he said yes, but I needed to be careful because it was all grown up and there are probably lots of giant snakes in the area. Oh, did I tell you I'm petrified of snakes? How I got, looking back at that, the nerve, the gumption, the strength to go in and study further about Alma is only God can, can answer that because I, as, as I'm saying, I'm kind of stuck for words here. Uh, yes, I'm petrified of snakes. Like some people are of spiders and some are of lizards. But back on to what happened on that December day. When I asked Mr. Fitzgerald if there was an old cemetery on this land, he said, yes, there was. But I needed to be very careful because it was all grown up. And of course, there were lots of snakes. In my case, with this cemetery search, I chose on purpose in late December. The grown up grasses were frozen back and any snakes were buried and sleeping for the winter. Or at least I thought so. I still remember driving my car across that large hayfield blaring out a song playing on AM radio station KTSA 55 out of San Antonio, Texas. And my car, as I could barely see the outline of the Colorado River below. I stopped at a grove of trees. I got out and I began to approach the area Mr. Fitzgerald told me about. I stopped and pinned down under my front tire was a four-foot-long copperhead snake. I still remember hoping the snake didn't have any family anywhere around, and the rest of them were asleep, but if this one was awake, I asked myself, what about the other ones? But that's another story. It wasn't long walking through the tall Johnson grass that, sure enough, there was an area where there were a dozen headstones. I walked around, 
and rubbed the dirt encrusted on each stone. All of them were etched in German. Hmm, where is the internet translator when one needs it? Not back then. But thank goodness for my great aunt who got her Ph.D., in foreign languages from Southwest Texas State Teachers College. Her name was Joanna Walling, and she was an unsung hero in World War II as she was behind the scenes deciphering all the messages from the Germans about their plans during World War II. Now, continuing. Um, or actually, <laughs> not continuing quite yet. I need a quick word from a sponsor, and I'll be right back. Have you heard about Anchor.fm by Spotify? It's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Yep, Anchor has the tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And now, for the rest of my story. Continuing, each headstone, rock, photograph, or candle on these old headstones represented a life lived a life that was undoubtedly filled with hopes and dreams, happiness and heartbreak. Each lies in rest with their mark left behind, their mark on our lives, and also what was left in remembrance on their marker. I took my notebook and wrote down the names and other information of the headstones, and then I took a Polaroid picture of them and was about to leave when I stumbled over a rock. I looked down, and a headstone was lying flat face down in the dirt. Went back to my car, got my shovel, and carefully remembered the snakes. I lifted it up ever so gently and stopped and watched for snakes to run out. I was ready, and then I turned it over. Yep. If you say no way, you would be wrong. It was, in fact, the final resting place of my great-grandfather's daughter. Then I stopped. Now I looked another dozen headstones, family members of others. When I wrote my first history book, before my writing career of fiction and nonfiction, it was my family history. I placed at the end a listing of all the grave sites that I visited and the names on each site and the birthdays and so forth. In the library in Columbus, the Nesbitt Memorial Library, my good friend Bill Stein said he did everything he could to hold the book together because of the daily use it received from others doing genealogy research. You might call it my first bestseller. Why did I spend so much time photographing and documenting these grave sites? Because this small act of my research opens the door for others to discover their own ancestors' stories. To understand and reconnect with our ancestors is to build our identities. So, when I walked up to that fallen tombstone in the back pasture of Fitzgerald's, there rose a feeling of brevity and wonder. I sat in a lawn chair and ran my finger across the etched birth and death dates and other information, all in German. You know that between one's birth and death dates, there's a lifetime of stories? An understanding shot through my mind that the daughter of my great-grandfather was where I am now. And someday, I will be where they now rest. When I stood quietly before the grave of my great aunt, a loved one, I appreciated that their story intermingled with mine. 
their influence contributed to my story. Let's take another incredible example of persistence. My great-great-grandfather came to Texas and settled just outside Frailsburg. His name was Johan. Now, Gerhard was my great-great-great-grandfather, arrived here in 1842 and settled two miles outside Frailsburg. A small church built in Frailsburg, just opposite the street corners, where on the other side was a Catholic church. Gerhard was a charter member of this Trinity Lutheran Church. I found his last will and testament in the courthouse of Colorado County. I also searched for his final resting place all over the northern part of the county. Did I tell you I never give up? <laughs> well, I suppose I should have started earlier at the church where he was a charter member, but I didn't. Go figure. You never know if you start right or start late. But either way, we'll find out if it paid off. Again, it was a cold winter day in December. I walked along the outside of the cemetery where St. Augustine grass was growing. It looked well taken care of and was just the backyard of the church there. I took a shovel with the metal part of the shovel removed and tied an ice pick onto the end. I began walking a large area back and forth. Finally, after sticking the ice pick into the dirt, and understand this isn't central Texas where there is a rock right under the grass. There are no rocks out there. Well, finally, I got a sound. Clang. Clang. I reached down and moved the grass just a little bit so it wouldn't mess up the yard and found part of the name of Farron. Now, Farron is a name associated with many members in Colorado County and probably the best friend of my great-great-great-grandfather since they both came from the same small area in Germany. And it was only half of his name of Farron Camp and it was on a broken stone. I kept doing this and checking. Then, that's when something happened. Several hundred feet outside the main cemetery, the familiar sound came clank, clank, made from the ice pick, striking something solid. I removed the grass, and sure enough, there was the headstone with the name etched of Gerhard S.T.R. Well, obviously, that stood for Struess. So I had found my great-great-great-grandfather's headstone. Unfortunately, there was nothing left but a broken stone. But that was good enough. I had found the resting place of my great-great-great-grandfather's headstone way back behind the church in Frailsburg. I didn't need to look for my other great-great-grandfather as he lost his life in the Battle of Vicksburg. To answer your question, yes, I've been there as well, believe it or not. And I have been given it a heck of a try. But there, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, are only mass graves at the site. But I do have the piece of paper that says where he lost his life fighting for the Confederacy. I found it in the George Library in Richmond, Texas. Someone once told me what a great place to do your family history studies, and they weren't wrong. Great library. Anyhow, there are many, many ways that a genealogist can be perceived by the people around us. It could be the one at the family reunion who shares stories upon stories with our relatives. The greatest mistake my new friend made was to never accept the help of, of another family history enthusiast. Families and their stories are never ending, and everyone has a story that can help another in their research. As a family reunion, we can let others know 
what we're currently researching and use these events to gather as much more information as possible. It's never ending. You always can find information that will help you for if you're a, a senior or a junior or getting started genealogist. But there's more to the perception of being a genuine genealogist or even being a professional genealogist. Has one stomped in the cemeteries grown up with grass and lots of snakes? Have they sat on a front porch with a person 100 years old and got their life story, including the people in their story? Have they gone through extensive rolls and rolls of microfilm at the Clayton Genealogical Library in Houston or through all the card catalogs on the Civil War and George Memorial Library in Richmond, Texas? Probably not so, because many use the invention of the Internet today. You know, in closing, I would like to talk to you or end up this broadcast today and mention about attending a function where someone brought their laptop and they did demonstrate to everyone about the wonderful connections that they had of the family and all the family history in a flow chart. John married Mary. Mary uh, got divorced. John then married such and such or whatever it might be. But there was nothing other than a flow chart showing who was who, when they're born and died and who they were connected to. I've been there. I took a lot of work, but it was work that had this new invention of the Internet to help tie together families and lost ones. It is the greatest invention since sliced bread when it comes time to doing family genealogy, I must admit. No more did I have to walk around in a cemetery and put together a printed document that was one of a kind and wrapped with a giant rubber band and stuck in the archive room in the Columbus Nesbitt Memorial Library for people to come in and get the names off of. You can find all these names today on the internet. So it is a remarkable tool for doing family history studies. But getting the stories, the stories of these people, that takes another invention all in itself. And sometimes, and actually many times, you have to walk on the ground they walked on. You have to go out and stare at the trees that they stared at. And then you get the feeling of standing in their footsteps. And once you're standing in their footsteps, other pieces of the puzzle come to you. That you can't get from the internet. No, my friends, in the end, not everyone's resting place is going to be the same. It might be a manicured or overgrown cemetery or ashes scattered over the cascade of a waterfall, or a respectfully placed urn in some hidden place, or raised heap of dirt under a two-century-old shade of an oak tree, or even a flat buried stone under cover of Johnson grass in a prairie, or underneath beautiful St. Augustine grass in the backyard of a church. Each gravesite represents the story of those who came before us. Before I go today, let me leave a family kept secret with you when starting out. If you're wanting to be a genealogist or you're wanting to do a family history, it's very important and it's so simple. It will save you from three to five or seven years of research just knowing this little tidbit. I had updated my family tree from the actual paperwork of one of my great-grandmothers. Her name was Evelyn. When are you using the easily gotten census records? Study them. Study them closely. I couldn't find my main family because I was looking for my last name, the way that I spell it. It took forever for me to learn 
to look up in the right-hand corner and find out the name of the person writing down the names. If it is, as an example, Schultz, then don't look for, in my case, Struess spelled with S-T-R-U-S-S. You look for Struess with a slur S. That's right. As Germans actually write it, they do not write an S-S. They write a slur S, which is an S-Z. So, sure enough, I should have been looking, after three or four years of research, for S-T-R-U-S-Z. Then, if you're looking up in the right-hand corner, and who's writing the name this time? You find that a uh, Mr. Smith is writing the names down? You don't look for Struess with a slur S, and you don't look for Struess with an S-T-R-U-S-S. You look for Struess the way an Englishman might write the name, and that's S-T-R-U-C-E. The first thing I recommend is to write your last name down as many ways as it sounds. Then, look for all the spellings in your research. Oh, and yes, someone wrote to me just the other day and said that in my research, I spelled my great-grandmother's name wrong. I should go back and correct it. They said it should have been Evelyn, E-V-A-L-I-N-E, not Evelyn, E-V-E-L-Y-N. Go figure. Well, gotta go. See you later, alligator, for another broadcast on the Sydney St. James Show. It is now being heard in hundreds of countries around the world. Be sure to share with friends the show or feel free and become a sponsor of this weekly presentation. Till next time, happy listening. Well, that does it for me for another great episode from Sydney St. James. Be sure to click on the tab above that says send a voice message and I will get it from you and I'll probably play it back on one of my future podcasts. Also, don't forget to click the button follow. I'd love for you to follow my podcast. But it's been fun. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, here I am, Sydney St. James. Happy listening.